Hello and welcome to Solar Alberta's 2021 seminar series. Today we're going to be learning about big commercial solar and energy efficiency case studies and opportunities in Alberta. We're delighted that so many of you could join us today. Please note we will be recording this webinar for future distributions so that those who missed out on registering through Zoom can still participate. Uh, the recorded sessions will be available on our website at solaralberta.ca in our solar series archive in a week's time. My name is Heather McKenzie. I'm the executive director of Solar Alberta. I'd like to take a minute to acknowledge that I'm hosting you today from Treaty 6 territory in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. Treaty 6 territory is the traditional gathering place and home of many indigenous peoples, including Nahiawak or Cree, Soto, Dene, Papas Chase, Blackfoot, Nakota Sioux, and Métis, nations whose ancestors' footsteps have marked this territory for centuries. Today, we're going to be sharing two presentations with you, and following that, we'll be taking some time for a Q&A period with our presenters. Throughout the event and after, you are encouraged to give us a shout out on social media using hashtag SolarAlberta. We're going to be using Zoom Q&A for the questions rather than the chat box. So please enter your questions in the Q&A section and you should be able to click on that section in your Zoom toolbar. Okay, and I see from the Q&A that there was a, a Zoom hiccup and some people might be joining us at one o'clock instead of noon and I apologize for that. I'll make sure to check on that later, but I will definitely be making this presentation available to everybody who may have had that uh, confusion in their uh, event invitation. So I do see we have quite a few people with us already though. And so I want to make sure we honor their time commitment as well. A little bit about Solar Alberta. Solar Alberta, this is our 30th year of operation. We are a not-for-profit society that is dedicated to public education about renewable energy and energy efficiency. We also serve as a hub for the solar industry here in Alberta and connect the general public to industry providers through our solar industry directory, our Alberta solar map, our regular events, and much more. On April 28th, we'll be hosting our annual general meeting, and I'd like to invite you all to sign up Solar Alberta members as Solar Alberta members and attend to elect your new board. There are a few vacancies to fill on the board this year, and they're very highly competitive positions. So if you're interested in chatting about the opportunities to serve on the board prior to the AGM, please don't hesitate to reach out to me at executive director at solaralberta.ca, and I'll connect you with the right folks to learn more about our board. We're pleased to have launched this annual solar seminar series online this year, and we anticipate that this venue will make our programming accessible to folks from many walks of life. We'll be offering a number of webinars on Thursdays over the lunch hour between now and September. We are currently accepting registrations for our March 25th event next week, at which we'll be learning more about solar PV from install to profits, as well as our April 8th event, at which we're going to learn about how renewables fit into the clean fuel regulations. We are always interested in developing more partnerships for our events. So if you or your company want to work with us to educate the public about the benefits of renewable energy, energy efficiency and climate change, please don't hesitate to reach out. All right, industry classes. We offer quite a few industry classes. Of course, we only have one left this, uh, this term, this batch. Uh, it is going to be with Eric Smiley. He's going to be talking about quality assurance, quality control, and commissioning solar photovoltaic systems. Our classes are scheduled in the evenings online over four nights within a few weeks of each other. There is a 10% discount for members, so you can register through solaralberta.ca if you're interested in our upcoming class. So today's uh, event is free and of course the entire series, the solar series on Thursdays at lunch is free. At, in thanks to the generous support of our members, volunteers and financial supporters. In particular, we're pleased and grateful to have Alta Pro as the premium sponsor for this lunch and learn event. Before we get started today, I just want to take a few minutes to introduce our panelists. We have with us Adam Trovato. And he's going to be speaking to us uh, at the start of our presentations today. Adam is a certified 
engineering technologist with a specialty in energy efficiency and renewables. In his current role as manager of business development and estimating at Sustainable Projects Group, Adam focuses on working with building owners and managers to develop ongoing and contextualized plans to reduce energy consumption, emissions, and operating costs within the confines of their budget, values, and physical environment, and to convert these plans into executed energy efficient, efficient projects, buildings, and organizations. Adam's presentation will discuss the importance of starting the energy efficiency and energy generation process with an energy audit and to establish a smart plan to address a company's goals for reducing greenhouse gas emissions and costs of operations. This presentation will take you through the auditing process and provide examples of what can be expected from the final deliverables. So welcome, Adam. Thanks for joining us today. We also have with us David De Bruin, and he is going to be speaking uh, after Adam. David has been in the electrical industry for over 15 years, being involved in a wide range of projects from multifamily, commercial, industrial, and solar photovoltaic projects. David has the expertise to understand all aspects of the job from concept to completion, building projects from early stages in design that flow into final commissioning of all systems has made him excel in developing cost-effective designs for clients and providing accurate budgets and estimates. David has key management skills from a PEC designation, a course that teaches complete company management from accounting, estimating to contract law and project management. David is managing the renewable generation portfolio for Alta Pro Electric, responsible for the complete design and turnkey solutions for clients tailored to site specific needs. He is extremely committed to the electrical industry Having started with his registered apprentice program at the age of 16, David is a leader in the design build electrical industry. Welcome, David. Thank you both very much for joining us today. Now I'm going to turn the mic over to Adam, who will share his presentation and then David. And following that, I'll be back to talk with you a few for a few minutes about the rebate programs. Uh, that are available to folks and uh, do the facilitated Q and A. There we go. Adam, you've got your presentation up. Feel free to turn your mic on and take it away. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the flattering introduction. Um, so yeah, thanks everyone for joining today. Um, as mentioned, my name is Adam Travato and I'm with Sustainable Projects Group. And today I'll be presenting on energy auditing in commercial facilities. So my presentation today is relatively brief and I'll try and motor through quite a bit. Um, I will begin with an introduction. We'll go over at a high level what an energy audit is, discuss why building owners tend to get them and the benefits of an audit. And following this, we'll dive into the actual process of an energy audit what it looks like both on site and off site, and what you can expect from a final deliverable, and then ultimately what you can do with that, uh, that deliverable. So quickly, who is SPG? Sustainable Projects Group is a design, build, energy efficiency, and sustainability consultant and contractor. We employ engineers, technologists, energy managers, electricians, plumbers, and so forth to provide energy auditing services and sustainability consulting as well as energy efficiency contracting. Um, so we have a total of about 50 staff members throughout Edmonton, Calgary, Sherwood Park, uh, Vancouver, and the Okanagan, as well as um, an active presence in uh, Saskatchewan. So um, what is an energy audit? Well, an energy audit is an assessment of a building that displays the current energy use of the facility along with the associated costs and needs of the building while communicating methods to reduce consumption without negatively impacting the building. So generally an audit will provide the building owner with upwards of, of you know, 10, you know, 10 to 20 potential projects commonly referred to as energy conservation measures that can help reduce the utility expenses, greenhouse gas emissions and improve the overall functionality of the building. 
All of these measures are accompanied by several environmental and financial metrics, such as simple payback, net present value, return on investment, greenhouse gas savings and abatement rate, and capital cost, which will allow for more effective and accurate capital planning and decision making. Um, generally, the measures that are looked at in, a, uh, in an audit will cover all aspects of a building, including the HVAC, building envelope, electrical and lighting, renewable energy potential controls, occupancy habits, and will identify distinct projects such as LED lighting retrofits, variable frequency drives, condensing boilers, solar PV, and many more. Um, audits are generally designated in three types. An ASHRAE level one audit, which is a walkthrough audit of a facility. It is a very, gives very high level and basic uh, recommendations as to potential projects and, and you know, class D estimates as to, uh, as to what, uh, what type of savings those will see. Um, a level two audit, which is generally the industry standard and is what this presentation will largely focus on, takes that uh, a step further for more refined costing, uh, more detailed analysis, and, uh, and is overall just sort of a more robust product than the level one. And an ASHRAE level three audit, which is an investment grade audit, and, and generally that's done um, just to receive a little bit more financial certainty. Um, often it's requested by third party financers and that's uh, that's that the only real difference between a level one or a level two and a level three is the need to uh, ongoing data logging and uh, a full comprehensive building model, which a lot of ASHRAE level two audits have anyhow. Um, in terms of costs, uh, obviously it varies greatly uh, facility to facility, but generally people want to know what the difference is between each of those. So. An ASHRAE level one can go from as little as you know thousand dollars to three thousand, um, whereas level two can be as little as two twenty five hundred to about ten thousand, and then a level three is going to be about between five thousand and fifteen thousand. And and yeah, obviously that's pretty site dependent and and scope dependent. So generally, there are a lot of motivations that are going to um, cause one to get an energy audit and it can fit into any of these boxes really. So environmental reasoning um, is very typical as, as gas, water and electricity use in Alberta is, has a direct correlation with greenhouse gas emissions. <clears throat> so that's pretty standard. Technological reasoning is very typical as well as building owners are, are looking to improve the functionality of their buildings through energy efficient projects. This can be something as simple as, you know, resolving a, a leaky window with some caulking or something, you know, pretty um, advanced as demand control ventilation um, that's going to improve the air quality and allow it to change with different occupancy levels. Um, so, yeah, the technological needs is often a, a large role. Um, the most prominent is, is obviously the financial uh, motivations, which you know, is going to play a role in any energy efficient in implementation decision, just because everyone does work with a budget, even when it's government money, you need to, you know, prove the payback of, of the project and whatnot. So that's going to be a very, very typical reasoning and then social and political. So reasons like green imaging, um, green building certifications, um, capturing government funding, aligning with internal politics. So a lot of those are reasons where why people get energy audits and um, often one reason to get an audit um, will, will kind of stem out and, and, and kind of check all the boxes anyway. So um, in terms of the benefits of an energy audit, they, they are quite vast and, and can depend from person to person where they see the most benefit. Um, but as you can see from the bullets, there are many distinct reasons to have an audit performed on your facility. Um, for one, benchmarking and understanding the facility. This is, this is pretty key <clears throat> as it will allow the building owners to set a baseline energy use for the facility, um, track this usage on an ongoing basis, and then post project actually verifying the energy savings. This is valuable for property management groups that, you know, move between property managers, uh, building to building. So there's some continuity uh, when you pass a building to a new property manager, they can get up to date with the site, what the utility rate is, what they can expect month to month. Um, so yeah, and then furthermore, this will actually often give the building owner and the, and the operator an opportunity to look at their utility bill, 
determine if they're on a good contract and then if needed, they can look to renegotiate their utility rate if they're paying too much. Um, also, there's energy conservation and project identification. So most building owners tend to know that they can save money on projects, but don't really know where to start. Um, so this is a perfect opportunity to identify projects and receive an apples to apples comparison between two projects. Uh, with an audit, you can clearly compare the impact of say a lighting retrofit versus a window replacement and, and evaluate them on identical metrics such as net present value, simple payback, um, return on investment, and then make a very clear and concise decision that's backed by a lot of metrics that your organization is looking to use. Once the projects are identified, we can work within the parameters of the building owner and the building itself, such as annual budget, equipment replacement intervals, occupancy, tenant changeover, and so on to provide a pathway and clear next steps to lowering greenhouse gas emissions, lowering utility and operating costs, accessing rebates and subsidies, and improving the building functionality. And then finally, an audit actually allows the owner and the operates, operators to pair the processes of capital planning, asset management, and sustainability into a single plan that maximizes every dollar that they invest into their facility while ensuring that it improves the, the ongoing functionality of the building. So I'll try and go through this pretty quick here. The process of an energy audit can vary you know, from site to site, but it generally does follow this path. Um, step one is to meet with the building representatives, discuss the scope, schedule, goals, timeline, all that. Um, once scheduled, <clears throat> a site visit will take place in which uh, an auditor will arrive at site, interview site personnel uh, to get a better understanding of the facility, go through the site, um, begin measuring uh, all the equipment, windows, uh, take record equipment, uh, record nameplates of boilers, furnaces, all that take a look at the roof, uh, electrical panels, and really go through all the nuts and bolts of the facility to get um, in order to put it into an energy model. Um, <clears throat> once that's complete, the, uh, the auditor will go through the building envelope and the mechanical equipment, as well as the electrical equipment with a thermal imaging camera and do a thermal imaging test, which will um, identify areas of uh, heat loss and poor thermal performance. And then, uh, yeah, generally around the site visit, the building representative will collect data, including utility bills, building drawings, building condition assessment reports, capital plans, and so forth that will support the analysis. Once the site visit and all that is complete, the auditor uh, basically enters into an engineering exercise in which they build an energy model and, be, and from that begin identifying potential projects that are uh, backed by the energy model and then they reach out to various contractors and use um, industry standard numbers to uh, estimate capital costs and do a whole bunch of engineering and math and create a uh, bunch of projects that are backed by financial metrics. Um, once these are identified, the final report's delivered to the client and we go over those uh, potential projects, discuss the available rebates that may apply for them, um, discuss the implementation timeline and what our recommendations are, and then we'll make adjustments to the report as needed and uh, try and provide some, try and adjust the, the, the plan based on what their actual next steps are so that the audit ultimately reflects the reality of the building owner. Um, in terms of on-site expectations, um, everything's pretty straightforward. An audit will generally take between three to eight hours. Um, two auditors is generally what we send, but it's going to vary from company to company. Um, sometimes you'll have to go to a second site visit, but that is for usually for multi, um, multi-building sites and very large facilities. Uh, the process includes a site visit with the building operators and property managers to review the facility and identify any hot spots and problem areas, measuring of the HVAC, um, and building envelope and electrical equipment, uh, recording that equipment, um, recording set points. So, you know, taking a look at where the thermostats are at, if uh, the lighting controls and all that, uh, doing a solar PV and renewables assessment and taking uh, a lot and a lot of pictures of the facility in order to refer back to while they're creating their energy model. 
following this, thermal imaging test is done as mentioned. And then once we, uh, once we are done that, we head back for our energy modeling and report writing. In terms of a final deliverable, um, you know, you'll, you'll see different structures, but they'll more or less have a facility description, utility analysis, energy end use breakdown, a bunch of energy conservation measures, next steps, and then a summary. And I'm just going to go through briefly sort of what this looks like. So um, this is just for a multi-unit residential facility that we did. Um, this is their water fixture. So this is a facility description. And the reason I'm showing this is this just this allows for a lot of value for the client. So, you know, in terms of replacing these, this gives the client a really good inventory of what they have in the building. But furthermore, they could very easily now go get a quote from various plumbing contractors to replace all of this. Um, they, the, the plumbing contractors may or may not want to go to site, but they could provide them all this information and get very clear cost as to what they, they uh, what that costs on their end and they can move forward with the projects very effectively. Um, same with the heating equipment. It's a you know detailed inventory of what they have. If they want to do like for like replacements, it's very simple to contact their suppliers. And if they want to, you know, take documents to tender, um, they have a lot of ammunition to go and do that. Um, so yeah, this and then furthermore, as you're transitioning from property manager to property manager, this is just a very good uh, background into the building that can get them up to date. The utility analysis, this is super straightforward. I won't spend much time on this, but this is a natural gas consumption profile and an electricity consumption profile. Um, you can see that these are both for three years. It, within the auditing process, it's, it's part of our job to identify any anomalies. So you'll see with the natural gas consumption, there's a, a little bit of a peak that happened in February of 2019. So in that auditing process, we would try and uncover what happened during that month and, and then ultimately ensure that it's resolved. So it can be various things, it could be a construction project, it could be a, a failing mechanical equipment, um, someone who, you know, failing building envelope, but it seems like that was resolved as 2020 and normalized. So nothing to worry about there for this site in particular. Energy end use breakdown, very simple also. Uh, this just gives you a, a detailed look of which building components are, are causing which respective energy use. So in this site in particular, you can see that they have a lot of opportunity to reduce uh, in lighting and they may, they may want to look at an elevator modernization. So that would, you know, the analysis will take it a step further and actually analyze those things. But then this will really give you a high level idea of where the opportunities lay within your facility. And this is generally the most valuable part of the audit and what most clients spend the most time on. And this is the individual lists of projects as well as their associated financial and environmental metrics. And this is, you know, generally what decisions are made on. So in this case, the client had identified a few projects that they had prioritized, which were lighting projects. Um, so that's why those were prioritized the most. And then they had set some parameters, which was a, a 15 year payback, I believe, and then a, a maximum capital cost of, I think, uh, $250,000. So within that, these were our recommendations. And then the client is able to, you know, evaluate the net if, if they're if they evaluate financials by net present value or return on investment payback, they can, they can pick and choose or use a combined metric if they want, and we can help them with that too. So this is really what all the analysis comes and, and ultimately results in. And yeah, and then finally, once that's all done, we tend to, you know, once the clients have identified projects that they want to move forward with, we can help them with a capital plan this is an example of three different sites um, and into a single capital plan where they have, you know, these are smaller projects, but they they had already approved these projects, and but they needed to um, have them implemented over a two year period based on that on a hundred thousand dollar budget and a hundred fifty thousand dollar budget in 2021 and 2022 respectively. So you know we go through this and we 
use the left uh, timing drop down and the client can play with the drop downs and then they can create different scenarios and look at the different paybacks and capital costs. So, you know, all in all, that is really the process of an energy audit and, and what we do for our clients and, um, you know, the process of, of converting an audit or several audits into a capital plan. Um, yeah, so this is really helpful for applying. Um, Heather's going to touch on this later, but applying for uh, government subsidies like the ESB and VERA program. Um, you know, that's why we have these, these line items for municipal, provincial, federal incentives, um, because, you know, they do make a big difference. And, and ultimately playing with those numbers is going to impact the payback and then impact the project summary and capital plan. So. I hope that wasn't too technical for you guys. It's hard to find cool pictures for energy efficiency, but I'm sure um, Dave will have some nice pictures of, of solar and, and everything. So um, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out, give me a call or email and uh, happy to talk energy efficiency. Um, I guess now we'll kick it over to the main event where uh, Dave is gonna teach us about some commercial solar. Awesome, thanks Adam. Uh, definitely plays into uh, some of the slides I have. So know your costs first if you want to understand your savings. So now I'll share my screen here. Um, all right, just confirming you guys see my slide right now before I get rocking. It's on there already. All right, so Alberta, big commercial solar, um, you know, fitting in the background. Uh, we have uh, Canada's largest uh, rooftop solar array. Uh, that one is in Atchison, Alberta. Um, and I'll talk about some of the financials that really comes into play for a commercial building owner uh, looking for it. Um, there we go, next screen. Okay, so a little introduction. I had a good one from Heather there, so I won't beat, the, beat that drum any further. She did a great job, so I appreciate that. Uh, a little bit about uh, Altpro Electric. So we are a design build electrical contractor. Uh, we service uh, a lot of markets in, in Edmonton and the surrounding area. So that's where we are headquartered, but we work all over Alberta. Uh, work on projects from the uh, commercial to industrial and obviously the solar PV space. Um, we have a, you know, a large maintenance team as well that uh, works with LED lighting upgrades and works with many of the grants that uh, Heather will talk about later as well, uh, the ESB program. Um, you know, for myself, I uh, also like to look at, you know, we, uh, we are a commercial building owner as well at Altpro, uh, multi-tenant CRU. So, you know, taking off the electrical contractor hat and look at it from a building owner perspective, you know, what is it what does it look like financially to put a, a large system uh, with your building either on the roof or a ground mount in the back uh, really there's a lot of things to look at so we'll, we'll peel into that today so first thing um, you got to understand your energy bill um, it, it, i will say until you understand that uh, you'll struggle to understand the savings on the solar system um, that will work with anything really even uh, to Atmos point for the other uh, you know, mechanical or LED lighting upgrades. Uh, this will be good knowledge for everything. Um, it's a big concern for many operators, especially when you see the pricing increase and you want to know what is wrong with my bill or what's going on. And you, you want to know what, how that thing is working. Um, and to be honest, the, the way we get charged for energy in Alberta, it, it is not simple. There are many different things that affect it. Um, and we'll go through that today. And uh, I'd like to get some good foundation there before we work into the financials and what the returns would look like for a solar system. So with that said, um, one of the main things that's driving in your bill, there are, there are delivery charges and, and uh, energy charges. So this first section here, this is, uh, this is regulated by the government. You know, there's a transmission section. Uh, that's really the, the cost to get the cables uh, from those generators out by Wabamum, you know, Genesee, Keep Hills, uh, or even the, the wind power plants down south uh, to get them to the substations in your local area. Uh, so those, those big tall power line, power lines, something's got to pay for those, and those are typically very fixed charges on your bill. Um, there's the distribution network, you know, those are those brown power poles you see on the side of the street, as well as those green power boxes on the side of the road. Um, and it's important to know that, you know, there are various wire service providers in, in Alberta. Um, you know, you have your ATCO, NMAX, uh, EPCOR, and uh, Equus down south and some others, uh, and really within each of those locations, they have different tariffs uh, within them. So there's a couple layers to this onion. Um, so depending on how much power you use or the size of the transformer in your street will dictate how you are being charged for your transmission and distribution charges. I'll refer to them as T and D. 
Um, some other good information, go to ucaalbertahelps.ca. It'll really help you uh, unpack your electrical bill and understand how you're charged. As well, there's access fees. So if you're the city of Calgary or city of Edmonton, you know, uh, there are access fees in your bills. And uh, one thing to note that that's a, a, a variable cost in your bill. So as you put solar on or reduce your energy costs, uh, that will have a greater effect on your savings for your bills. So that's um, one thing to look at when you add, uh, add solar or reduce your energy costs, it will affect your municipal access fees uh, quite a bit. So we'll get into the energy charge section. So this is really the only, uh, some of the only items that are affected by your energy retailer. So understand there are two different things going on in your bill. You have your, your wire service provider and your retailer. Sometimes they're the same, uh, but they are, they are different. Um, some are regulated, some are not. Um, so they handle your commodity cost of your energy, you know, whether they're buying it from Genesee or, you know, other big power plant, uh, you know, coal or natural gas or wind. Uh, they handle the training charges and they really just flow through the costs from the wire service provider. So if Fortis is saying your transmission distribution is this, they take that on and pass it through the bill. They're, you know, they're really aggregating everything and sending it to uh, in a nice, uh, uh, you know, one-stop shop. Um, and also to note that customers are free to choose a retailer of their choice. Um, you know, you, no matter where you are, you're free to go with any retailer. Just know that um, just because you're in Edmonton doesn't mean you're with Epcor or Calgary. It really depends. So uh, UC Alberta helps also to unpack that further. Um, I'll move on, I guess, to the next one here. Um, I'll, I'll look at actually our bill for our commercial CRU just to help give some more clarity there. So this is actually our bill here from, from Altro for our commercial CRU. Um, so some items to key on here, those are your, your, your regulated charges, your, your uh, transmission, distribution, um, and some of those municipal access fees, really your taxes to the city of Edmonton, however you want to put it. Um, and then these are going to be uh, from your retailer. So they're take, the retailer is going to take the, you know, the blue arrows and, and flow it through in the bill. Um, and there's your, your administration fees, your obviously your energy and commodity costs uh, for our building, obviously we're at 6.7 cents a kilowatt hour. Um, and really some things that you, you may not see. So our building is actually electrically net zero, but you see that there's still a bill here. So uh, that's always one thing that comes with solar. You know, I put solar on, how come I still have this big bill? Uh, it's because, you know, we are not producing a lot of energy right now in February. Plus the meter is only as smart as what it sees. So while we are creating some energy in February, um, it will not show up on the bill. So it's important to know that uh, there are things going on behind the meter that you not may be aware of or savings. So you can't just look at your electrical bill uh, after you've installed the solar system and say, well, I'm not seeing the savings here. It's because you can't see it unless you've installed some extra metering. Um, so in the summertime, you know, sometimes we'll see $1,800 credits. We won't even pay for our power bill, but that comes up in, in the summertime. So it's important to understand how your power bill works, where your credits come in. Um, there's a lot of different things that go on there in the background. And another thing I want to point out is your, your levelized cost of energy. So we paid over a thousand bucks. Um, we used uh, 7,000 kilohours of energy. You know, that's 15.98 cents all in. By the time you stack it up, by the time the penny drops, that's what we paid per kilowatt hour. Um, with all the transmission distribution in. and that'll you know be key in the next couple slides here as you uh, understand uh, some of the paybacks. Um, it's also asked to talk about some solar club opportunities from Solar Alberta so I'll run into that because there are some some instances where this makes sense. Uh, so the solar club it's basically a um, it's basically I guess to start there there's the microgen regulation which dictates for Alberta on a solar system uh, that you get uh, what you get charged on the way out. So if you're exporting energy, you get it at the same rate you bought it for. So really in the months when you are net, a net exporter, if you crank your rate to let's say 25.85 cents, um, you get that on the way out on the sale. So there are obviously pros and cons to this. If you put this rate on in, in a month when you were not an export, exporter, you will be, you'll be shooting yourself in the foot. So this is, it's, it's key that this is a great opportunity, but you'd have to know how to use this rate. And when you toggle from your low rate to your high rate, so low rate 6.7, high rate 25. Um, so I, I've attached some graphs here of a, of a location where it would make sense. So those are the only months here in green where you should be on that high rate. If you toggle it on any other month, you'll be actually costing yourself uh, more money on your, on your energy bill. So it is really important to know your building load. And with that, the best way is to install some meters on your service that shows 
you know, on the chart on the left, your, your actual red line, which is your load versus your generation. And until you start to track that and trend that and know exactly how you use and generate energy, um, then you probably look into this. But uh, so there are some retailers that use this uh, rate, the solar club, uh, you know, Alberta Utility Source, one of them. There's a, there's a bunch more. I encourage you to go to ucalbertahelps.ca and take a look at those. Okay, so some types of commercial solar installations. Uh, I'll kind of run through from the most cost effective uh, solar attachments to, um, you know, a little more expensive, but still, uh, you know, they all have their costs and benefits. So standing seam on the left here, you know, this is, uh, you know, a large majority of the roofs uh, in, in Alberta. Uh, it is definitely the most cost effective way to deliver solar. Uh, there's rails that clip onto the seams. There's no penetrations. Uh, these systems fly in very quickly um, and are very cost effective. Um, obviously the weight is very low as well. You're typically talking about only adding three PSF to your roof. So structural capacity is usually not an issue unless you have a very large hanging load. Then you get into the ballasted systems. We see a lot of these on the schools that we build. Um, uh, any membrane different from TPO to SBS or EPDM. Um, there's ballast weights that sit behind the modules you can't quite see here. Um, one thing to note is where those pads are, the rubber pads um, between the rows. You know, we add another sacrificial membrane below that because, uh, you know, these systems expand and contract on your roof and adding the extra layer keeps with your warranty, you know, whether it be Arca or Suprema. Uh, so it's important to, to know the, the limitations of your roof warranty and make sure you uh, make sure you work with those. Uh, we see structural capacities. Uh, we get this question all the time, you know, do I have to beef up my structure if they're building a building? Uh, typically, the answer is no. If you get a nice array. Um, these systems can weigh between four to 10 PSF. And a lot of times if it's built to current building code, you will be fine. Um, but I guess the answer is it depends. Uh, we see a lot within that range. Uh, you can see high, uh, high tilt on standing seam. It's another way if you want to you know, generate some better energy profile curve, but obviously reduces the capacity on the roof. Um, there's also fixed structure. So if you would say you're on a flat roof and you want to chair up the, uh, the modules a bit and also, it'll help for if you have a structural uh, feasibility problem. This is obviously much lighter because it's not ballasted, um, but the cost is there obviously to, to have the penetrations. Um, you know, with any system, there are pros and cons, and it's always uh, there's many options on the table. So, uh, having a contractor go through, you can pick and choose what makes the most sense for the project. Uh, we've done a lot of wall solar. Um, you know, when we first started to get into it, we weren't really sure. You know, you, statistical data for us drives everything. Uh, now we have a lot of these systems, uh, they perform quite well, you know, very consistent, especially with the low sun angle in the winter. And you obviously don't have any soiling problems with the snow. So, um, you know, they perform very well. And like Frank's red hot sauce, we put that on everything. So <laughs> if you can find some space for solar, we'll, we'll try to put it on there. Um, yeah, for the industrial users, if you have not a lot of roof space, but you have a lot of land space, uh, you know, a ground line may be of, uh, um, better, especially if you have a, you know, a, a brown field that cannot be used. Um, you know, obviously every generation has a different profile. Uh, ground mount has a very uh, high performing profile, but uh, you know, it always comes at a cost of land, right? Uh, as a commercial business owner, you can know that land is very costly as well. Um, so there's many different variables and I know I'm just adding variables before we get into the financial review, but it's, it's important to see that there's a lot of options and a lot of things that drive the financial return and you know what you should do as a commercial building owner. Um, I want to do this and uh, I don't think you will probably ever have a solar contractor showing you a picture with snow on modules, but I'm going to be the guy to do it because it does affect your system and its performance and it's important to understand it. Um, so on the top chart there, you can see how a 35 degree ground mount tilt has, you know, very steady production in the winter, even with the uh, low sun hours and uh, with the snow on it, it'll shed off uh, quite nicely. Uh, whereas down low, if you got the five degree tilt, uh, a roof, you know, you may have months where you may not produce much at all. They may not even move the needle at all. So it's, it's important to note that there is snow and you have to account for those losses when, uh, when you're forecasting for some financial returns, you have to make sure you're accurately uh, saying what the system is going to produce. So uh, I definitely caution business owners that you don't get maybe duped by someone over promising and under delivering. Uh, you know, a lot of our systems are uh, based off of statistical data, and we use that to forecast. So whether it be, uh, you know, high tilt or low tilt, we have a lot of sites we monitor and can understand, you know, how should we be soiling these these losses? Because snow does affect what we have, um, and it's important to to know that before you give someone some financial return data. 
Um, you never want to overpromise and underdeliver. That is for sure. Okay, so uh, now we're going to get into what it looks like for a commercial building owner. Um, I've been given some uh, some permission from Roseno Transport to, to showcase their building. Uh, we did the system in 2019. It was 160 kilowatt uh, solar array. Uh, we used some Hanwha 30 85 watt modules, uh, and it's on a standing seam roof. Uh, you know, interesting to note we have solar on the north side of this building on a low tilt, and it does work. Uh, it does work quite well. Um, if you have the roof space available, and your your goal is to get to, to get net zero, like this building is electrically, uh, we ended up using that, and you see we have a little more space to spare. But um, that was the goal for the system, and we did hit that target. So here's some comparisons of how the system actually performed. So, you know, we have proposals and we have construction projects, but it's important to see how they actually performed. Uh, so this is how they did. Uh, you see, we installed this in 2019 and uh, really our, the blue lines are the 2020 year. You'll see how it actually did perform. Uh, you can see how a typical month would use. I pulled the seventh month here of 2020. So you can see that there are days when you have cloud cover and you know, your generation waves in and out. Um, and then also, you know, what a day would look like, a uh, typical day in the summer as well. So you would see this thing turns on very early in the morning. Uh, that's in part to the, the north facing solar. Um, and it goes very late in the afternoon and a very, you know, very broad uh, production uh, uh, bell curve there. So that's what a, I guess a typical production would look like for a building like that, standing seam, very low tilt. Uh, to date, this thing has done 221 megawatt hours of energy and counting. Today's a good day to look outside. This thing is pumping. It's, if it's exporting, I can guarantee it right now. Um, so this is the system data we used. It is producing 102% of the building use. So it is electrically net zero. And to my knowledge, the uh, probably the most uh, electrically net zero uh, logistics company that I know of right now for one of their facilities, 880 kilowatt hour kilowatt power for, I guess, all the solar nerds out there. This is the number that is used to show, you know, based on your nameplate, how much energy it produces for the year. So this is where it comes into, okay, you have a system, what is it gonna do in the year? It's a number that derives uh, basically a multiple of what it, what it did for energy. Um, so just wanna point out, you know, the old building consumption in blue and then what we had in solar in 2020. And I'll go to the next slide here. So this is where it comes in for your case study. Um, you gotta know your building's load and, and how, you're, you, how you use your energy and how you generate it will dictate your returns. Until you know that, uh, you can have some assumptions, but it's important to see this, and I'll show you this. So 138,000 kilowatt hours was used in 2018 on that facility. Um, and when in solar was installed, it still bought 100,000 kilowatt hours of electricity. And really, it, it, when solar was producing, it only offset 27% uh, of the load because when you have a, a load that does not line up with your generation, a lot of it gets exported. So how those two in intertwine really affects your financials. Um, but the system exported 109,000 kilowatt hours. So you can see like that's depending on where the revenue streams come from and the building and the load, um, uh, it, it does change. So you can see the red line uh, as well as what, uh, what the building did do after. Uh, the solar was installed. And this here, the circle, this is where that um, solar club comes in. If you're exporting like a mother trucker, pun intended, uh, sorry, or in that area, that is when you can actually, you know, crank your rate and, and have some very lucrative returns. So if you are going net zero, chances are you will be having some very large net export months and take advantage of this. If you're not, uh, chances are you probably should not be doing some uh, some net zero, or not some not net zero, some uh, solar club, and just stick with your regular retail rate. Keep it at as low as you can, and and run with those returns. So financial drivers, this may be what everyone's kind of looking for here. Um, like I said, you have to have your energy rate figured out um, and and know that going forward, and you need to understand the rate class you're on. So if you're with Fortis and you're on a rate 61 you need to know, you know, what of your bill is fixed and what of it is variable. And we can use that to forecast the returns. Uh, you know, are you a, are you a for-profit business uh, that can access some tax savings? Are you in a small or high Alberta tax rate? Um, are you going to be purchasing the system or, or financing? Um, I know uh, Adam had touched on this before, you know, are you focusing on your return on investment or a cash on cash return? Or are you going to be balance sheeting this or looking for levered returns? Knowing that upfront uh, really helps uh, 
us understand, you know, what makes sense for, for you as the, as the client. Um, and really your cost of capital and access to lending. Uh, this comes in big when you're, see if you're building a new commercial building and you're already taking on some debt to do that, if you can add that to the construction costs without much more of a down payment or depending how your lending goes, you can really lever on those returns and have some, some, some lucrative savings. Uh, if you're an existing uh, building owner and you're looking to refinance uh, and take on some capital projects and, and access some of your equity in the, in, in the building, um, you can obviously access some great, great rates. Um, and I definitely recommend it because when you install a solar system, you're essentially prepaying for your energy. So it, maybe it makes sense to pull it over time um, if you don't have the capital to really take that a full on on the balance sheet. Um, some auxiliary assumptions, uh, you know, sample time, you know, solar is good for 30 years on their, on their module warranty, but it will run much longer. So um, we forecast for 30 years uh, just because that's the warranties, but uh, don't be mistaken, solar does last longer. Um, there's inflation that is involved, uh, energy cost increase as well as system degradation. So we take all that into account and run some assumptions. Um, for purposes going forward, I'm gonna use the case study from Rosano for the building use of the load and the generation and, and put a you know indicative cost to a system like that. About a, a dollar six per watt for a cost for, for a budget. Um, it would cost around $254,000 without a grant. So this is a you know full cap cost. Um, right now there's a 25% rebate available from the ERA, uh, which is going quickly, which Heather will get into. Um, we're gonna assume a high Alberta tax rate, assume you're paying six cents a kilowatt hour on your retail rate, um, using the same rate tariff uh, that Rosano was in there with the rate 61. Um, and also with no, no municipal access fees, which is actually gonna hurt the presentation on the next page I'm gonna show you, because if you have municipal access fees, that actually helps your return with solar because you, the more you chew away at your kilowatt hour, the better, the better the return with those. So this is a commercial building with that uh, indicative dollar six per watt. And you know, with that noted, you know, a little caveat, um, it really depends on the building. Some are installed much cheaper, some are installed much more, um, and it really depends. So I kind of picking a number here in the middle and, and running with that to forecast what it would look like for a commercial building owner to add at their building. So as you can see here um, on the top, the uh, 138,000 kilowatt hours before you had solar um, with that Rosano building, you still had to buy 100,000 kilowatt hours. So you save, save some there uh, for the year on that portion of the, uh, the review. Your capacity demand charges, those are your fixed charges on your bill that are not going to go away. There's a cost of that transformer on the street in front of your building. And whether you are generating or not, uh, something has to pay for that. So that's gonna be fixed. Um, some peak demand charges does go down. You can see some savings there and the variable transmission distribution. Um, the, these numbers here, the peak demand and the variable, that comes into how well your load versus your generation overlay. So if you're gonna be, um, you know, producing at the same time your load is a, a lot more um, consistently, your variable transmission distribution charges will go down quite a bit more. Um, so with that, um, you know, you're, you're looking at an 8.1% IRR, 11 year return on investment. Uh, and this is with the tax savings applied by the way. So there, there's a lot of meat and potatoes in the tax savings. And it is very important to understand that. Um, levelized cost of energy of four cents. Um, and year two, with your tax savings in, you'll see an OPEX reduction of 26,000 uh, on a building like that. So going down into the commercial finance model, it is you know, carbon copy of what is above there, um, but you see there's the annual finance cost that comes in for 15,812. So once you take that on, um, you, know, you see that there is, there is a delta there and that's your finance cost. Uh, but even with that, look at the IRR. Uh, if you lever your capital and put down a solar system, you can boost your returns uh, uh, by quite a bit. Uh, your ROI goes up because you are obviously paying for financing costs and your levelized cost of energy of 5.15 cents. Uh, year two, with your tax savings in, uh, you're still saving 10, 10, nine on your, on your OPEX for the building. Um, one thing I really wanna point out here is your levelized cost of energy. So like the energy bill I showed in the beginning of the slide, you know, we paid, you know, just under 16 cents a kilowatt hour all in uh, a solar system. You can create your energy delivery, everything all in. There's no admin charge for that uh, for either four or 5.15 cents a kilowatt hour. So for that energy that you are consuming on site and not selling, that is your delivered cost for that energy. And that's where these savings come from for solar for long term. 
So there's there's many, many other uh, factors that come into it, and I'm sure there may be some more questions. Um, and we can get into that uh, in the Q&A session. But uh, I guess so in closing, you know, here's here's a, that uh, Canada's largest rooftop solar system. Like I said, it's a standing seam, um, you know, very cost effective to deliver. Uh, this is for a client Freedom Cannabis out in Atchison. Um, and it was constructed by NMAX and Elthpro. And, you know, in closing, I will say, if, if you're a commercial building owner and you pay a lot of taxes and you pay a lot on your energy bill and you have a large rooftop, uh, chances are there are some, some large OPEX savings that are on the tabing for, table for you. So it is, it is good to look into and especially if access to lending or a strong balance sheet, uh, uh, now is the time, especially with the ERA grants available. Um, for any questions, feel free to reach out uh, on our website, uh, altpro.ca or uh, our email, solar at altpro. .ca. Um, at this point, I'll, I'll kick things back over to, to Heather. I'm sure we're going to start off their, their grant process, and uh, I'm not sure if we do the Q&A after, but I'll, I'll let her take it from there. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate those presentations, and uh, I, I will just touch briefly on the uh, grant programs that you've mentioned. Of course, we have um, the new ERA's $55 million energy savings for business program, which offers up to 250,000 per project. So that's for uh, companies, not for profits all across Alberta. If, you're, if your business is, an, is in Edmonton, you can additionally access the uh, city of Edmonton's new building energy retrofit accelerator program. So that's called BERA. And that's for energy efficiency specifically. You can actually stack the two programs to see some real benefits there if you're in Edmonton. For solar, you can't participate in the, the City of Edmonton's Vera program, but for a limited time, you can still access the, the ERA's new uh, $55 million uh, ESB program. Uh, we did receive notice yesterday that that program is extremely well subscribed. In the last two months alone, they've already uh, they've already hit 21% uh, of program funding for solar alone. Uh, they're going to let it get up to 30% and then they're going to cut us off. So if you want to get in on the solar commercial uh, rebate opportunity with the ERA, you've got to go fast because that's going to be, um, be I, I, I'm, I suspect we may, be, we, we may be full up by the end of the month even. So make it happen if you're interested. Um, and then of course, uh, for both energy efficiency and solar PV, you do have to be working with a qualified service provider to take part in these rebate programs. So you can find out who qualifies to these programs or these services through uh, the ERA website or the city of Edmonton website. If you're looking to do solar, you will have to have an installer who is uh, a member with, uh, with our organization, with Solar Alberta or uh, CANRIA, the, the national, um, association for renewables and uh, you can look up all those qualified installers on our directory at solaralberta.ca to find a, a quick one if you're trying to participate quickly in the uh, in the uh, solar rebate program for commercial then you'll you can go to our directory and find the installers to uh, to get some quotes from uh, of course, uh, we hosted a seminar about both the ERA and the City of Edmonton's BIRA program a few weeks ago, and there is a video of it available for free already. You can go to solaralberta.ca down and just uh, click on the Solar Series Archive under Events, and you can find that program right there. They'll have all the details. And so, too, we have had uh, an issue we've discovered today with daylight savings times. And I think I thank everybody in the comments for explaining what went wrong because I thought, was it my calendar that was wrong? But it turns out we, uh, we established the registration for this webinar when we were in MST. And then on the weekend, we of course switched to MDT. And, uh, and so a number of people are gonna be potentially logging on now thinking that we are starting at one. We are gonna go to 1.15 for Q and A. So everybody will be able to participate in that. Uh, however, I'm going to quickly make this entire presentation available uh, for folks to access who did register for the event, so nobody will miss out on it. We have been recording it, and you'll get all the details. We're going to jump into our Q&A now for a little bit uh, and pick the brains of our presenters some more. If you have questions, please don't hesitate to add, add them to the Q&A box in the Zoom, and you can upvote others' questions. I see we have two here, and then I have a number of of que burning questions that I also want to ask you too today that came up as I heard you present. So I'm going to just 
uh, start off though with the participants questions here. So what is the cost of a level two energy audit for say a, a 10,000 square foot building office building and how far does the $10,000 rebate from the city of Edmonton go? Do you want to touch on that one, Adam? Yep, so a, a relatively small office space like that, um, assuming normal conditions, we would probably go in and audit that for under $5,000 and then in order to, uh, for an ASHRAE level two, and then um, the city of Edmonton audit will cover 50% of that. So that will be, you know, let's say 5,000 for this case, 5,000, it would cover 2,500. And then um, also the ESB program will cover energy audits if as, as a line item cost, um, if you apply for an implementation measure. So say you ended up moving forward with a lighting project, um, you would likely see that audit be rebated to a total of 75%. So. Okay, and uh, thank you for that. Anything you wanted to add on that, Dave, or want to switch into some uh, solar PV questions here for you? <laughs> no, no, that makes sense. Okay, sounds good. So it, let, here's a question about Red Deer, but I actually think this could apply to all. Uh, I imagine people are wondering this in general. I'm getting a lot of questions about power storage right now. We're even running a battery storage class, right? Like we're right in the midst of it at Solar Alberta. So wondering about, uh, are you using any uh, power storage for uh, the deployed solar system in Red Deer? Have you integrated energy storage into your projects in general? Where are you at with that? And how does it factor into your, uh, your recommendations to clients? For sure. Uh, so for the, the system in Red Deer, uh, there are no batteries for it. It is a 100% grid tied. Um, and the reason is, uh, depending on how you get charged for your energy, sometimes it makes sense to, to have no battery where they use the grid as your, your, uh, your battery. So when you're producing more than you consume, instead of storing it, you just sell it at your, your rate and buy it back later for a zero cost. So you do get a little bit of a haircut because you save, get that transmission distribution way back, but the cost of your transmission and distribution from what we've seen on a lot of the systems does not uh, overcome the cost of the, 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 the battery. Um, so that's in general, uh, you know, we do a lot of systems with, with no batteries and, uh, but that is not to say that they do not work. There are some instances where uh, if you have a very low power consumption and have a huge spike um, and then carry on a low power consumption, if you uh, have some sort of energy storage to bring that spike down, uh, it, it'll save you quite a bit on your energy bill because when it spikes, it may hit a new ratchet on your bill and you get charged for that transmission distribution demand for the entire month. So sometimes some bills, uh, depending on how you use for energy, it would make sense to integrate that, but uh, it, you know, very select cases right now that we look at battery storage to help bring the, the bills down. A lot of time we say, you know, just export it. Really, the, the meter's spinning you when you have your load, and when the solar's generating, it spins in reverse and logs credits, and you're constantly buying back and forth, and uh, the grid is your battery is our recommendation. Yeah, and that makes a lot of sense, especially if you're in one of the major cities. I suppose if you were if you were in a very uh, remote location, you might want to have some local reliable uh, storage capacity and, and maybe have different considerations depending on where your business is, hey? That's correct, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and I think a lot of people are talking about batteries these days as well because they're thinking about utility scale developments. I mean, could you maybe touch on that? I think for folks who are new to solar, uh, they might not necessarily understand the difference when you say commercial solar versus utility scale solar. Do you maybe want to just touch on that for, for anyone who's new to this topic? For sure. Um, you know, a lot of times uh, we toggle utility scale in our brains when we start to see a big central inverter. So, uh, you know, for, for utility scale, you typically have very, very large inverters uh, over a megawatt uh, in most cases. Um, and really you see them between five to really hundreds of megawatts. I'm not sure if that's anyone's seen the Green Gate power projects going on down south. Uh, that's what we consider utility scale, but, you know, re really it's an interesting topic because uh, in Alberta, it's kind of in its infancy stage as, uh, you know, compared to the rest of the globe for uh, doing these projects. So, you know, I would say what was considered utility scale is a different thing than it was uh, maybe four years ago when you see a you know, four or, 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 or five megawatt system go on the grid, you know, we would have considered that utility scale at the time. So the, I'd say the, the definition is a little bit moving now, um, but really anything over five megawatts is a, is a good, good number to use uh, in, in my mind. 
Yeah, it's pretty amazing the transformation that's uh, occurring here in Alberta as as more utility scale comes online. It's uh, it's changing the face of solar for sure, and the questions that we're getting are, are changing accordingly. So it's it's helpful to have you both here today. Here's another question from our audience. Ryan is wondering: uh, We own a retail space that covers common area electrical costs through the uh, the operating costs. If we drop the electric costs via solar, how can we recover this from tenants? Have you had any experience with this? I have. Yes. So this is an interesting one, and it uh, it really depends on you know how your your lease agreements are set up, whether it's triple net. Um, or maybe some other forms of maybe uh, just, uh, uh, I forget what that's called. There's another, there's another term for it, but basically if, if you can reduce your OPEX as the, as the landlord, uh, but have a set rate you charge the tenants for for energy, um, the big difference is are you, are you gonna meter their usage? Um, uh, until you kind of meter their usage and, and proportionally charge their, their usage to them, uh, you can't really, you end up passing on that benefit to, to the retail uh, person that is in the space. So uh, I'd say to answer the question in short, you know, it depends on your, your, your lease contract you've set up with everyone in, in the building, um, or if it's just a standard condo board feed. Um, if you keep your fee the same, but install the solar, solar system on a condo board, you know, really then the, the building gets, gets, the, gets the benefit. If you're doing a triple net billing where um, you, know, you pass on all the proportionate costs to the tenants, and if you save energy, then you pass along those savings to the tenant. Uh, yeah, it's kind of a little bit uh, once you open that can of worms, but there, there are ways to install a solar system and keep the benefits to, to the building owner. Uh, it really depends on your lease setup and if you're okay. metering their energy. Thank you for that. Yeah. So I have a question about sequencing. I get this all the time and I didn't see it pop up today, but I have a feeling there are a few people wondering this. You know, we talk about solar, we talk about energy efficiency upgrades. I mean, which do you do first and, and why? Because, uh, you know what, what? What? How would you order those two, <laughs> those two major major components? You want? I can take this one. Um, so yeah, generally, you know, we think of it as a as a pyramid or a triangle, and and you're going to want to start with with the bottom, which is just actually operational and low cost, no cost uh, options. So that's the first thing you should do. So that's adjusting your thermostat to, you know, throttling it down from 21 to 17 when everyone leaves the building. Um, that's doing simple operational things like switching your filters uh, to your furnace, maybe annual caulking to your windows and things like that. So that's the first step. Then the second step is generally to try and reduce the load by implementing some energy efficiency measures, especially the low hanging fruit. So reducing the load, especially the electrical load as much as possible prior to investing in generation is generally the most cost effective. So switching from incandescent LED lights, uh, you know, converting potentially to a condensing system. Those are some, you know, typical ones that pay back relatively quickly. And then following that, once your load is minimized as much as financially feasible, that's when you start looking to uh, generate power. And I don't know if, if you tend to agree with that, Dave, but that's uh, that's generally my my perspective. Yeah, yeah, no, I share that. Uh, I'm aligned with that. Uh, sometimes the best returns is not using the energy in the first place. Uh, you, you could spend a lot of uh, of capital to, to to offset it, but you know some simple ones uh, like HVAC or, or LED lighting. You know they have some very quick ROIs um, and are they're very low hanging fruit and something that should definitely be considered um, when looking at how to spend your capital at your commercial building. Okay, appreciate that. And I, I guess this leads to my next question, which I also get a lot is, you know, what are your opinions on doing this kind of piecemeal approach where you kind of knock things off one after the other as you can afford them, as opposed to just like finding the means to do a massive retrofit and just just getting it all done at once? You know, what are the how do you weigh the costs and benefits and, and when would it make sense to just just go for it and get it all done at once, a full package deal. Go ahead, Dave. Yeah, I'll have something small, I guess, on it. Um, one thing we run into when we are putting in some applications for a solar PV system is, you know, you're really supposed to size the, the generation to, to, the, to the building. And we try to work with the wire source providers to do that. So, uh, you know, if you put on solar after you reduce your load, you know, you've really reduced the amount that you could put on for a solar system for, and that would get approved. 
um, you know, they, they don't want you uh, to export uh, like crazy, uh, you know, on your meter. The, the regulation was designed to, um, you know, basically produce what you consume. Um, so if you, if you put in your application afterwards, you know, your, your, your ability to put in a larger solar system will decrease. So maybe take that in consideration while you start ordering your, 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 your measures you're going to be using in the building. Um, but, you know, other than that, uh, with that, you know, I, I'd still, you know, as a building owner, I'd probably do the, the low-hanging fruit first. Um, you know, as much as solar helps, uh, if you got an ROI of, of two years on something like that, that was where I would look first too. And, you know, saying that very truthfully. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I, I tend to agree with that. And, and one, one thing I would say on that is that when you're looking, it's, it's really going to be capital driven. So because buildings are living systems, really, if you change your lights, you know, you know if you change from a certain light, to an LED, a lot of the time, one of the one of the impacts is that you'll actually need to technically increase the uh, the heating load will go go up, or you'll need to increase the heating capacity. Sorry. So, because buildings are are living and the the systems interact with one another, often it would be ideal to do it all at once in the sense that okay, if we really um, if we tighten up our building envelope. We can, we can really reduce the size of our HVAC system. But if we do them independent of one another, it's really hard to really marry those processes and create the most ideal building. So all things being equal, I would say it's great to do it as a single deep energy retrofit in which you can really make sure that the building is optimized moving forward. But because of the reality of budgets, generally it's best to start picking off the low hanging fruit and the simple building systems that don't necessarily impact other building systems as much. Once you start picking those off, you can start looking at the larger capital projects like a boiler replacement, window replacements, full facade retrofits, solar PV. And then at the end of it, you'll have a, a, a probably a very similar product to one that you would in a deep energy retrofit. Okay. Thanks for that. I appreciate it. We talk a lot about ROE on investment, return on investment, and I am curious. I know at a smaller scale, when you look at putting solar PV on your home, for example, uh, nowadays, a lot of us are talking about that or seeing that as not just an investment, but act, like not just an investment in terms of your utility bills, but actually increasing the value of your home. Uh, so you're, you're not just going to pay it off through utility bills. I often say, you know, it's the, it's the only renovation and the only home improvement I've done that's going to pay for itself, really, because I, I anticipate when I sell my home, I'll be able to tack on the 12 grand that my solar costs me, right? Uh, in addition to the savings on my utility bills. Would the same be true for commercial solar, you know, where, where if you're putting it up, then your actual property value might actually increase and you could see more than just a return on investment from utility bills, but actually in the value of your property? You know, th this does come up. Um, and I think as the industry progresses and, and gets more used to having a, a generating asset on the building, it, it will definitely drive up the, the value of the building just because it, it will cost a lot less to maintain. Um, you know, I think the mindset is starting to, to grow a lot more and realize on the residential scale, and it's no different for a commercial building. Um, you know, same thing for my house. I have a solar system, and, uh, you know, I financed it. I levered on there, and uh, even with paying for my financing charges, I'm still ahead by $400 a year. So while I'm yeah. financing, I'm cash flowing, paying down the asset positive. So it's kind of a no-brainer for me. Obviously, I'm using the, the solar club to... to, to you know, increase those gains, but um, yeah, it definitely is a, a good, it's not always about ROI. It's going to take a few years to pay it off, but it's paying itself off. There are a variety of, of benefits. So I appreciate that you need people to, to think through what their, the benefits they are, they're looking for, where their savings they're hoping to get are. I think uh, in particular, when you look at, um, at solar, you know, a typical install is going to be uh, insured probably for almost 25 years sometimes. And then the panels themselves can last for up to 40 years or more. And so, of course, uh, if you invest in a, in a new uh, washing machine or something, well, it'll be long gone and, and not really supporting your, uh, your transition when the time comes. But solar will still be there and still be viable uh, if you do need to sell 
of course, businesses probably turn over a lot uh, slower than your average home, but <laughs> I could be wrong about that too. So we have another question here from our audience, the solar club members. For the solar club members, the energy is compensated at a higher rate. So how does the WSP deal with T and D charges? For example, uh, 100 kilowatts of solar on a building that consumes 75 kilowatts with a tariff on ratchet. Will the ratchet be forgiven while selling or do you have a new 85% peak based on the outgoing energy? And I would just beg of you both for anyone on the line who's not familiar with these terms, if you could actually also explain these terms in your responses, I think that'd be very helpful. For sure. Um, so so for the, the ratchet that you're talking about, uh, I guess I'll, I'll go into the rate again. So. Uh, depending on the rate class you're in, whether it be Fortis or some other wire service providers like ADCO, um, if you're on a rate 61 or 63, there is a, a minimum charge that you get when you've installed the, the uh, I guess, the service for the building. You signed a contract, uh, maybe you're not aware of it, but there was a, a minimum demand that you, you had signed for. Uh, and there's a minimum demand and then there's a ratchet that gets set based on your usage. So if you pop over and uh, use more energy than your contract, it'll set your new transmission distribution charge for that month and charge you that till it resets the next month. So it's, it's, uh, uh, it's something to be aware of as a, as a commercial building owner when you use your energy. If you have very high spikes, it is uh, not very good for your electrical bill uh, to put it lightly. Um, so the question is if you are exporting, you know, will you, uh, so in those, in those moments when you are increasing the energy but flowing in reverse, does it set that new ratchet? Uh, and to our knowledge, it does not. Uh, so we've pulled some 15-minute some, uh, meter data and look at what the, uh, what the demand charges are, and they do not ratchet up when, when the energy goes out the other way, if that answers the question. So um, really that ratchet only gets sent, uh, gets cranked on the way in if you hit over that peak. So you are, you are sheltered there. Awesome. Well, thank you both very much. I, I think we could grill you all day. I've got a whole slew of questions here I wanted to ask you, but I haven't got all the time in the world. For those of you who just joined us at one o'clock, because I did see about 20 people pop on the line then, I want you to be aware that we had an issue due to the change between uh, Mountain Standard Time and the new Daylight Savings uh, Time. So we are going to send you all this recording right away, those who registered. I have been recording it. You will get both presentations as soon as possible. And uh, you'll be able to hear all the, the good information that was shared today. I apologize for that confusion. Uh, it was something uh, unforeseen. I didn't realize that Zoom wouldn't join us in the transition <laughs> over the weekend that we all, that we all went on. Uh, but I wanna thank you all for attending today. Encourage you to stay tuned, follow Solar Alberta on social media. Sign up for our newsletter at solaralberta.ca. And of course you can become a member to re receive special member bulletins and a variety of other benefits. Dave, Adam, it's been a pleasure hearing and learning from you today. I really wanna thank you both for taking the time and to Ultra Pro, of course, for sponsoring our, our session this afternoon. Thank you very much. Awesome, well, have a great one. Look forward to hosting you all again in the future. Thanks for Thank joining you. us. Thanks everyone.